As we bask under the light of the third quarter moon, as is our fashion, we turn our minds to the Via Positiva, the path of awe, wonder, and savoring. Because we've been talking about how to build a new Christopagan movement and how to root ourselves into Druidry, we thought it might be fun today to celebrate this moon by talking about how we can revive the House of Prayer. Let's talk about that today as we walk together down creation's paths. Hello everybody, my name is Charlie. I am a Christopagan Druid and a priest of Bridget. I'm joined today by my husband. Hello, I'm Brian. I am a Christopagan Druid and sous chef to the Dangda. Today, we're going to be talking about something very near and dear to my heart. And honestly, if I could sing and I knew we wouldn't get copyright takedowns from them, I would have started this with that line from Jesus Christ Superstar, my temple should be a house of prayer. But I can't hit that high note. I can't get anywhere near that high note. And I'm not going to punish anybody by pretending that I can't. That's how I wanted to start today's episode. Before we get into it, if you haven't already, don't forget to like, subscribe, follow on the platform you're listening to us on. We do new episodes on Crystal Pagan and Druid topics every Monday through Friday. You don't want to miss anything that we're doing because it's a lot of juicy, deep dives into stuff. A lot of them are in answers to your questions. Keep those questions coming so that we can build a beautiful and vibrant community together. One of my favorite images is that of the house of prayer. I remember as a child, my great grandmother telling me about this. And this is like what we would now call foreshadowing for later. Later that week, I was out playing in the woods as I did. I came into this little hollow, all the trees around it. I just had a moment of, whew, we are in the church. I remember that idea of this being a, our places of worship, being a house of prayer. And I just started praying and singing and dancing and having a good old time in there. Every time I think about church, every time I think about community, every time I think about what I either miss or want to see brought back or made in this world today, I go back to that memory of me as a child in the woods, just freely singing and giving into the glory of God, just really present in the moment. As a Christopagan, that Christian side of things reminds me that my body is a temple, my heart is the altar, and my life is a living sacrifice. People take that and be like, so you must suffer and blah, blah. No, that's not what that means. If you actually go back to the prophets, when they were actually doing sacrifices, God was very clear. I don't want your burnt offerings. I want your love. The actual word there is chesed. I want your loving kindness. In other words, like we were talking about in our episode on the two laws of God, that we should love God and our neighbor, that's sacrifice that's being talked there. Living in love and compassion. We don't have to have a physical place to be in the house of prayer. Your body is a house of prayer. My body is a house of prayer. But I do kind of miss having a physical house of prayer to go to. It can be very nice to have that physical space. It makes me think back to when we were talking about creating those sacred spaces. The, the nice thing is any space can be turned into a house of prayer. Start by first creating that sacred space and then recognizing it. It seems silly to make that the second step, but it really is because a lot of times people will make a sacred space and not even recognize that they have made a sacred space. So then recognizing it, acknowledging this is a sacred space and then utilizing it, enjoying it, partaking in it, having that relationship with that space. That's how you revive a house of prayer. I'm really, in my heart of hearts, a bit of an old school revivalist. I mean, I grew up in the Baptist church. My grandfather was Baptist minister. My great grandfather was Baptist minister. That's the tradition that I came from. And oh, I want to see a glorious revival in this country. And it's not necessarily of my faith or a specific faith, but just a revival of enchantment. This is the one thing in the modern world since the 1700s since the so-called enlightenment has tried to take away from people. This idea that our lives are enchanted, magical, wonderful places. They've tried to rob us of spirit, of joy, of the simple pleasures of life. And I think more than anything right now, I want to see a revival. I get so enlivened, enthusiastic when I see what's going on amongst our witchy siblings. I really do see this witchy revival happening right now. I get very excited with what I'm seeing amongst our pagan siblings. But I do see this pagan revival that's happening right now. And I think that we are starting to see that in Druidry 
a little bit. I've noticed that a lot of people over the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years have really started latching onto this idea of Christopaganry and what we can do when we mix the old ways and the new. I want to see a revival. I want to see the people coming back to life. So much of the news media, social media in general, feels so geared towards making us feel dejected, alone, isolated, broken, defeated. It's that second part of the line from the song. It's why it's so powerful. But you have made it a den of thieves. There are so many thieves out there, so to speak, allegorically speaking, that want to come in and steal the joy, steal the spirit, steal the magic out of our houses of prayer. And out of our lives. Because remember, that's the same thing. They're one in the same They're thing. They're one in the same thing. Unless you're a very sad person and your house is a medieval dungeon. I'm really sorry. I, Some people turn their temple, their body into a medieval dungeon. And it's like a place of torture and torment and suffering and isolation. And it's very sad. I see so <laughs> many people giving in to doom and doomerism. And fear that maybe doom is the best path for them to take. One of the last meetings I went to of this group that would get together and discuss environmental issues. The guest speaker, who was a renowned guest speaker who I had heard of and was really curious to hear what he said, started off by just saying that he's given up. He's accepted that extinction is going to happen, that everything's going to fall apart, that nothing good is ever going to happen again. And then we all just need to wake up and realize that. I was so angry. Not just because I think he's wrong. I don't think doom is ever the right posture to take on anything. We as a planet, have survived numerous mass extinctions. The entire planet for solid, at least once, but probably a couple times, life found a way to go forward. The human species had an extreme bottleneck not that long ago that we can see the genetic remnants of and the aftermath of, and we don't know what caused it. We still to this day don't know what caused it. We've survived plagues, wars, famines. Life finds a way. I don't have doom. Because I know that life will find a way. And I understand for someone who is very fixated and very human-centric, not understanding this deeper connection or having this deeper connection with all life. But I don't see doom. I like to bring up, like we talked about yesterday, where life is a journey. When that doom starts to creep in, it's okay to take a moment and go, I'm tired. Just like when you're traveling, when you're on a hike or, or walking, it's okay to go, I'm tired and taking a moment and resting. And recognizing that you're resting, you haven't moved in. This is not the end of the journey, especially when it comes to activism, like environmental activism or any big activism. It's a long and difficult journey. It's important to remember to stop and rest, giving in to the doom, making that your home, you've fallen off the path of your journey. That shouldn't be your end spot that you should recognize, oh, I've wandered from the path. You can always choose to wander back. For me, that's just giving into the dark side. And yeah. I don't even want to fixate on it, on it as much because to me, when I say I want revival, when we need to bring revival to the house of prayer, I really do mean revival. We need to bring in new life. We need to bring back a spirit of joy. I'm working on an article right now that is inspired by something that John Verve put out going at this idea of how do we find meaning in life? It's been tricksy to write because I'm trying to be broad, but also I am really talking about from a Christo-Pagan Druid perspective. What I've learned from writing this more than anything is making sure that in my own language, I'm understanding that difference between of and in. I'm not here to teach you the meaning of life. I don't think life in that way has a meaning, but each and every one of us can find meaning in life, meaning in the small things in having a meal together, in having a good glass of wine if you can, in enjoying a wonderful scotch, in relishing a beautiful sunset, in that blinding supermoon that we had earlier in the month. As Joseph Campbell would say, it is savoring those moments yeah. in life. The experience of being alive. That's what all of these forces that are arrayed against us are trying to distract us from. I don't like... The words content and consumer i use them because i live in this soup of language that we all do they're so common that it's hard to keep them from creeping into my own vocabulary i'm sure i've used one of those words in this episode already because it's hard for me not to 
But all of those are designed to keep us buying things, to keep us afraid and giving up our money and our power and our autonomy to others. That's really where revival needs to kick in. We see so many false starts as someone practicing Irish Druidry to the best of my ability and trying to be a part of the revival of Christopagan Irish Druidry. This idea that we just did an episode on the truth of sovereignty is such an important idea. But every time I use that word, every time I write that word down, I want to write a long passage about, I'm not talking about the sovereign citizen movement and blah, 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 yeah. blah, blah. That's a false start. We have so many false starts where people are seeing this problem of needing to go back to basics. If you really do want to go out into the woods and be a homesteader, more power to you. I'm not going to say anything wrong about somebody. I think we need to interrogate these instincts that we're having. What we're wanting to do is get away from this consumerist culture, this capitalist culture that's just trying to make us be buyers, consumers. This is where truth of sovereignty does come in. Yeah. It's recognizing that a societal construct is an entity in and of itself. You first have to recognize that and the relationship that you're living within that. So late stage capitalism is a societal construct that governs and permeates. It is an entity in which all of us have a relationship with on some level. And we have to recognize that and then recognize how to operate within it. Because once again, just attacking it, going directly at it head on, you're in for a fight. It wants to preserve its existence. Remember to constantly be turning those keys, especially that key constantly. of impermanence. The way things are now is not the way things have always been. I just remember back to my youth, how things were very different. I remember back to the nineties, my early adulthood, where things were very different. And I can see how the internet played a part in changing things and various other actors have made a play at changing things. But the things that we take for granted now, having to get up and go to a job, that's new. But we've only been doing that as a species for a couple hundred years. We like to write onto the past. That's what people did before, but it's not the yeah. professions that existed prior to the industrial revolution and what professions became after the industrial revolution are two different things. And that's important for us to realize because that means the idea of a profession is malleable. It can change. The idea of what a workday looks like changed with the industrial revolution and can change again. A work week has changed multiple times in our history. The idea of a family and a community has changed so much. Once again, capitalism went, Ooh, I can get, I can produce more capital if I divide a family up. So the children now have to move out so they can buy more homes. It's literally for the sales of homes, grandparents and their children's children, three generations. Now those are three homes sold, even more homes sold three when times I, the sales. It's that entity trying to feed, trying to grow itself. You know, when I was a kid, I lived in this huge extended family. I knew my great grandparents, my grandparents, my siblings lived close by early on. As we changed, as we adopted neoliberalism, and this isn't really about the politics of it. It's just how it has changed and shaped things. As Reagan came into power and we started changing the way we structured our society to align with neoliberalism, my siblings all scattered to the wind. My cousins drifted away. I used to be really close to a lot of my extended family. When I say cousins, I don't just mean my parents and siblings, kids. I knew my grandparents, siblings, grandkids. I grew up in a very extended family where I knew my great uncles and my great aunts. And I get lost on the familial terms in English. Once you start going to the family tree on those sides, they were just aunt and uncle. Yeah. They weren't my parents, siblings. They were just my aunts and uncles. They were part of the family my cousins here, there, and yonder. And I was a part of this huge extended family. And I watched that get torn apart. And it's not just a function of time. It's a function of, well, jobs are here. So we're going to move to the place where we can get the jobs. It's a function of how different parts of the family engaged with different consumer lifestyles and changed. And now with the exception of really one branch of my family, those family reunions don't happen anymore. We used to, every one to two years, have huge family reunions where all of the cousins came together and we had all sit out and have a cookout and have a big family thing. Those don't, with, like I said, with the exception of one line of my family, those never happen anymore. We've talked about trying to do them and they fall apart because, well, you know, cousin so-and-so and cousin so-and-so really can't be in a room with each other anymore because of their beliefs about this business or this political ideology or da-da-da. 
we all disagreed back in the day. We just knew how to be civil and share space at a public park together. We don't have that anymore. That is something that neoliberalism took away from us. That's what we need to revive. That's what we need to bring back. This idea that you don't have to agree with everybody. This idea that I am 100% right and people that do not agree with me is the enemy is such a poisonous idea. It's infected our religions. It's infected our social groups. It's infected our fandoms. There's not a layer of society that doesn't have that poison in it right now. If we're going to revive something worth having, that poison has to get worked out. We have to move that out. There are only a few fandoms that I actively participate in because the people at the heads of those fandoms actively work to remove those toxic elements. You come in, start trying to divide people, you're out. You come in and you start trying to oppress and mock and make fun of people, you're out. This is not what we're here for. We have to start changing the way we're living our lives and the way we are structuring ourselves, really start bringing back this idea of we're here for love. Like I remember hanging out with cousins and I only saw them like once a year at the family reunions. We would have such a good time together. And it was like no time passed in the intro. We'd catch up on, well, what have you been doing since we last saw each other? Then we'd run off and do things. I still have some cousins that I'm like that way. Again, on that one side of my family that has somehow remained free of a lot of that. And don't think I'm not like trying to do sociological studies to try to figure out why this one branch of my family is apparently immune to this. I, I don't know. Maybe just because that part of the family has always been very, we are this family. That's been core to being a part of that family. I, I don't know. If I figure it out, I will definitely share it with you. That's the new life we need to bring back. If you're here to talk about your favorite, if you go somewhere to talk about your favorite music, talk about your favorite music. Don't sit there talking about what you hate about modern music. Because you know what? There's a lot of things about modern pop music I don't like. But I can also tell you a bunch of new singers that I love. That change of perspective where you're supporting the things that you love, this to me was the promise of the internet. This is what the internet could have been for a brief moment in history when we thought the geeks were going to inherit the earth. It was. But see, that's not profitable. Division is profitable. Getting people angry keeps people on site more. So that division gets stoked and gets stirred. We need a revival in the house. Our prayer life, it is our life we live in community with others. It's not just that time we spend alone saying the words, doing the practices, our time alone in meditation. That's not our prayer life. The first book by Matthew Fox I ever read was called Prayer, A Radical Response to Life. I highly recommend you read that book if you've never read it. Because at that time, I was obsessed with these movements in Orthodox Christianity that taught this idea that we should pray continuously. To them, that involved chanting. They were all saying the Jesus prayer. Oh, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Or, oh, Jesus, son of God, have mercy on me. Over and over and over and over and over again. It's time, time to have formal prayer, pull out a rosary. We just chant a whole bunch of times that prayer. So that it's always running on repeat in the back of your head. That is a valid form of prayer. What I've come to, where I'm at in my life now, is prayer is that place I go to where I commune with the one life. And I could commune with my guides, guardians, and gods to help me have the strength to pray throughout the rest of my day, to be that beacon of hope, of compassion, of mercy, of kindness, of humility that I want to be and that I think the world needs. That's what the physical church should be doing. That's what our physical prayer time should be doing. When you stop your day and you say your prayers, where before you go to bed, certain important times in the day, whether it's just that time that you meditate, do yoga, ride your bike, do your walk, whatever it is. That's practice. That's why we call it that. The real game is continuing that same energy everywhere. And that's the energy we all need right now. That's the energy we need in the world right now. And it's infectious. When people see that you have a certain joy about you, a certain peace about you, they want to know where it comes from. That's how we spread this. And it's not easy. Look, I understand having those concerns and those worries. I also do, because I'm a Christo pagan, believe what Jesus said. Have anxiety for nothing. Behold the lily of the field and the fineness of its clothes. If God adorned them in such fabulous raiment, how much more will he clothe you? It sounds like a platitude. I know when people read the Sermon on the Mount, 
they feel like those are platitudes. I've been through times of struggle. I know what it means to have very, very little, but I also know that there's a way in there to have what you need. I'm not worried about what food I'm going to have on the table. Somehow we'll figure it out. We'll get there to the blessings of the one life and the interconnectedness of us all. We will get to where we need to get those needs met. I've seen the kindness of strangers. I've been that kindness to strangers. But as we can move beyond that anxiety, that doom, and really do become those beacons of hope and compassion, we can bring this house of prayer back to life. With it, the rest of the world. This is the work of restoring the world. It starts with restoring yourself. It always starts with restoring yourself. Because if you're broken down, you're not going to have the stamina <laughs> to do the other building that needs to happen. You always start with yourself. I hope that that was a bit of inspiration for you. I see a lot of people struggling right now. I feel those struggles. I feel those pains. I also know that everything changes. And the real trick and secret and art of life is just getting used to that fact that everything changes. That you won't be surprised when things change. If this has helped you at all, if you can, give us a like. If you're listening to us on iTunes, write us a review. That really helps us out more than you know. How are you reviving the house in prayer? How are you finding that revival in yourself, in your community, in your neighborhoods? Let us know in the comments. If you're on YouTube or Spotify, you can leave a comment right there. If you're anywhere else, you can leave that comment there, but just copy it. Head over to creationspassive.com, click on the chat, and you can leave it there. That way we can see it because the other places don't notify us. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to see how you're doing this work because I know a lot of us are. We get a lot of encouragement when we hear the ways that others are doing this work. While you're over there, if you have a few dollars, you can pass our way. You can sign up for a membership. That helps a lot in helping us keep the lights on and keep food on our table. If you want to help us out somewhere else, you can support us on Patreon and Ko-fi. I am C.E. Dorset on both. C-E-D-O-R-S-E-T-T. That goes to support everything I do from the music to the art to the fiction writing and everything. And if you don't have any money but you want to help out anyway, share, share our content with other people. There, I use the word. I use the word. I just caught myself. Share this podcast with other people. Help us to grow. Help us to get the message out. Because the more of us that are working towards a better world, the sooner we will get to that better world. And may the power of the one life revitalize you and give you strength to bring your house of prayer, your body, mind, and spirit into the fullness of life. That you may go out there and be a beacon of hope, compassion, and joy. So you can kindle that fire to bring new life to all the worlds. Amen. Amen. Amen.